Hello, you are listening to the Secular Buddhism Podcast, and this is episode number 12. I am your host, Noah Roshetta, and today I'm talking about meditation through non-meditation. I'm also sharing the poem, Dust If You Must, by Rose Milligan. So thank you for joining. I like to say this every time before I start, this quote from the Dalai Lama where he says, do not try to use what you learn from Buddhism to be a Buddhist. Use it to be a better whatever you already are. Please keep this in mind as you listen and learn about the topics and concepts discussed in this podcast episode, and hopefully this will provide you with some information to help you be a better whatever you already are. Now let's jump into this week's topic. I'm excited to be back with you for another podcast episode this week, and I wanted to start out with sharing another milestone. Um, This has been an exciting week for me. I was out of town um, over the weekend on a family trip, and when I came back in the morning, I was checking um, our Facebook page, and I was really surprised to see uh, that one of the posts that I had shared had gone viral. And this was really meaningful to me. Earlier in the year, I guess it was at the end of last year, I came across a post from Jason Silva, who's the host of Brain Games on National Geographic. And he has a a web series called Shots of Awe, where he posts these small tidbits of philosophical uh, information, or um, I forget how he, what he calls it, but it's, it's essentially a three to five minute Uh, feast of philosophical thought. Um, And it's really fascinating. And it's something that inspired me to want to share what I'm passionate about, which is um, secular Buddhism. And something he shared that really resonated with me was the concept of redefining what it means to be a billionaire. And the way he explains it is that what if we took this, rather than being a monetary value that we strive for, strive to have uh, money in in the sense of being a billionaire, what if we redefine that to say a billionaire is someone who can influence the lives of a billion people, in influencing their lives for the positive? And when I heard that, I just loved that idea. I thought, we go through life chasing after things, right? And money is a big one. And And I know that there's so much more to life than earning money, paying bills, and then dying. And everything that I had studied, been studying at the time and learning about Buddhism um, drove me to this one emphasis of how do we learn to just live life to the fullest and live in the present moment? And when I heard that idea that he taught about redefining what it means to be a, be a billionaire, I knew right then and there that that's something I wanted to aspire to. Um, to be able to provide a set of uh, tools or information or some form of platform that can inspire people to want to be better, to have a more positive existence, a more positive way of living. And it was literally January 1st where I decided, okay, well, I'm going to start a podcast. And I started working on this and I developed a Facebook page and a blog and a website all around this concept of sharing Buddhism through a secular lens, the lens that made the most sense to me. And it's been fascinating to watch this grow and become what it's becoming. And I think in a very Buddhist way, it's exciting to see that there's no goal in mind. It's just I'm allowing it to be what it is. And I don't know what that is yet because it's constantly changing and evolving, uh, which is the very nature of existence, right? The the nature of impermanence, the nature of interdependence. But this weekend, the, the exciting milestone I got to experience was uh, seeing one of my posts go viral. And up until this point, anything that I tend to share online, whether it be in the form of the podcast or a blog post or a Facebook post or anything like that, You know, it has a, it's grown to the point where it gets seen by thousands of people and that's been exciting. But what happened this weekend took it to a whole new level. Uh, When I checked, I, at first I couldn't believe that these numbers were true 
because what happened over the weekend is that one of the posts that I shared, which is a poem called Dust If You Must, had gone viral and it had been seen by um, over 10 million people over the course of the weekend. And I thought, how is that possible? And out of that, um, there were just over 1 million interactions with the with this post, um, which caused all of the other posts and everything else that I've been posting online to just explode. Suddenly, hundreds and thousands of new people were subscribing to the seven-day Introduction to Buddhism course that's available on secularbuddhism.com. And, um, you know, overnight, I was waking up finding out there are 8,000 new subscribers or 8,000 new followers. Um, and it, it's just fascinating. These are, it's still, you know, I, ha- I had a similar experience last October. Um, and some of you may not know this about me, but I develop products. I have a company and we manufacture photography accessories. And I've been doing this for five years. That's my, that's what I do for work. I I manufacture photography accessories. And I remember having this almost, uh, this really profound experience visiting Hong Kong and meeting with, with businesses. And I'm walking through the mall and I come across this photography store and I'm standing there and there on the back wall are five or six of the products I've developed just hanging, you know, in the store. And as I'm staring at them, the, the, the uh, the salesperson for the store comes up comes up to me and she's like, "Oh, would you like to buy one of these tripods?" And I just got teary eyed because this was the culmination of years of work for me, designing and developing a brand of products, and putting in a lot of hard work and countless sleepless sleepless nights and stressful uh, deals and loans and everything that entails building a business and manufacturing products. And here I was, uh, almost literally on the other side of the world, standing in a store, looking at something that, that I had created. And it was a very moving and humbling experience to me because it felt like all this started as an idea. And here I was sharing something that meant something to me, creating products that I was passionate about with photography. And there they were in this random store in a mall in Hong Kong. And, and it was just really moving for me. It's the first time it made me realize that we can take something and work on it and it can become something. Um, so I had that similar experience this weekend with uh, Jason Silva's invitation to redefine what it means to be a billionaire, to be able to share or or influence in a positive way, the lives of a billion people. When I first heard that, I thought, I want to, I want to redefine what it means to be a millionaire. Cause I, you know, I thought it'll, I don't know how to, how to do that with a billion people, but, um, this weekend alone, it has the ideas that I've been sharing through this platform have been seen by over 10 million people. And, uh, over a million people actually interacting with my posts. It's really humbling. And it's humbling from the from the sense that, you know, this started as an idea. I, I genuinely believe that with the right perspective and with the proper un- understanding of impermanence and interdependence, it can change your life to see the world in this, in this light. I believe that uh, the Dharma, the way that it was taught, and is taught through the lens of of Buddhism can be life-changing. And I believe that the key to changing the world is changing ourselves. And by providing the teachings of the Dharma and teachings through secular Buddhism, people who are secular-minded like like me um, can make sense of these fantastic philosophical teachings that inspire to be a better person to have a more positive life. And it's been fun to see that this weekend in numbers that uh, exceeded my, my dreams, especially this uh, soon in the process. It's only been four months uh, since this podcast started. So that's been really exciting for me. And I wanted to share that milestone with you. So again, thank you uh, for sharing and spreading the messages that are shared through this platform, through the Facebook page, through the study group. It's, um, 
it's really rewarding for me to receive emails from people who are saying, thank you for sharing this, this, you know, this new concept or this approach that I hadn't explored before has literally changed my life. That's very rewarding. And that's why I'm doing this because first it changed my life. And now it's exciting to see how this is improving in a positive way, the lives of others. So I want to share with you the poem that I shared, this poem that went viral. And I think this touches on something that resonates with people. Obviously, that's why it went viral. But the the title of this poem is called Dust If You Must. And it goes like this, like this. Dust if you must. Dust if you must, but wouldn't it be better to paint a picture or write a letter? Bake a cake or plant a seed? Ponder the difference between want and need. Dust if you must, but there's not much time, with rivers to swim and mountains to climb, music to hear and books to read, friends to cherish and life to lead. Dust if you must, but the world's out there, with the sun in your eyes and the wind in your hair. A flutter of snow, a shower of rain, this day will not come back around again. Dust if you must, but bear in mind, old age will come, and it's not kind. And when you go, and go you must, you yourself will make more dust. That poem is by Rose Milligan. And when I found that and shared that on the Secular Buddhism Facebook page, um, I noticed right away that the messaging really resonates with people. And this isn't an attack on dusting or on cleaning. <laughs> I think that's that's obvious that the the key to this message is that we go through life doing. And in the process of doing, we sometimes forget to just be. So my understanding of this, the way this makes sense to me, is the process of doing versus being. And it makes me want to share the concept of meditation from a different perspective because You know, we spend a lot of time meditating. And I think when I teach meditation, one of the first things that happens is we get really excited about meditating. And we want to, because we want something out of it. We want to be calm. We want to have more peace in life. And there's an objective. And then over time, as as it becomes a consistent practice, it's common to hear from people who say, okay, I've been doing this for several months now. And yeah, it made me a lot more calm. But now what? Or, or people will say, well, now I'm realizing things I hadn't realized before. I tend to, you know, I tend to get mad easily, or I tend to have a temper. So I wanted to discuss meditation a little bit from the perspective of the key to meditation being non-meditation or this idea of uh, doing versus being. When I teach meditation to someone, mindfulness meditation, I usually explain how you know, to imagine a pond and there's a pond that has muddy water and what would, what would happen, what would have to happen for that muddy water to become clear? Um, Alan Watts says muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. And you can picture this with a, a, a muddy pond. You know, if you were to leave it and let it sit still or, or, you know, take a jar and put dirt in the water in that jar and shake it up and, it, and the water is going to be really muddy. But if you put it down and leave it alone and give it time, all of that uh, mud settles to the bottom. And then what you have is clear water again. And this is called, uh, this is the first, I guess, level of, of meditation, which is calm and abiding meditation. It's learning to still the waters, the muddy waters. And what happens as a consequence to learning to still those waters is that then the water is clear and now you move on to this phase of insight meditation. You're able to look into that pond and see what's actually there. This is looking into the nature of awareness, the nature of the mind, and see what's really there. And I think something that happens when 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 you learn about meditation and you decide, okay, I want to start meditating is we start to develop expectations about what meditation is, what it's going to do for me, how I'm going to benefit from it. And that becomes the very thing that that Buddhism is trying to um, eliminate from us, is that natural tendency, the, the reactivity that we have to create meaning around things. So 
the, there's this concept that there there is what is, and then there's the story we create around what is. And I think this is really common when it comes to meditation or when it comes to life in general. We have we create meaning around it, and and that's not a bad thing because we you know creating meaning meaning around life is is part of life. But it, with meditation, it can be detrimental to create meaning around what meditation is. And a lot of teachers will talk about this concept of the key to meditating is to not meditate. Because the moment I say I'm going to meditate, I have that's a concept in my mind that means something. I'm, whatever that means to you, that's the meaning you've given to meditation. It is this or that, or it causes this or causes that, or, you know, whatever concept you hold about what meditation is can be useful to the point of, um, helping you to be calm, to, to gain this calm, uh, clarity that you need. And then insight meditation to start to be able to see the nature of awareness. But when this is done properly and the mind or thoughts have been calm, enough for the the mud to settle so to speak and for the water to become clear to the point where you can start to see the nature of the mind the way the mind works then the concept that you have about what meditation is actually becomes a hindrance to progressing to the full purpose of meditation which is with that insight when you can finally see what's really there what you're going to gain out of this is the one thing that Buddhism is trying to uh, get you to see, which is seeing things as they are. So um, again, let me, just to clarify, the concept of non-meditation or meditation, the key to meditation being non-meditation is that we want to let go of the concept of what meditation is. And I think this this becomes very relevant with what I shared last week in the podcast with the uh, parable of the raft. What the Buddha taught is that the raft is something that you need. And, and let's say in this case, you know, he taught it was specifically the Dharma, the teachings, which in this case we could uh, equate to meditation. And it's like it's this tool that you use and your life depends on it to, to be able to accomplish what you're trying to get. But at some point you have to learn to let go. And the concept of letting go from the sense of meditation is that if you really want to get what meditation is all about, then you'll learn that what it's all about is about not meditating. And that's the difference between uh, doing. It's not something that you do. It's about how you are. It's about being, doing versus being. So to take meditation to that next level, at some point, you have to understand that the whole purpose of meditation is that is that you don't meditate. You're learning to just be with what is. And that's why when I when I teach meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation, what I what I try to convey is this concept that what there's nothing magical happening. Nothing happens. All you're doing is learning to be with what with, with what is. It's kind of the exercise of becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and that can be confusing to people because then it's like, well, what's the point of all this? I'm if I'm just sitting here, well think about this. How often do, do we really spend time with just being with something, not doing anything, just being with what is? I think one of the sources of, of all of our problems is that the minute that we start um, meditating or, or doing anything, we're creating meaning, right? And, and then we can't allow things to just be as they are. So Meditation can be this practice, and, and this is a, a, a technique that's used um, in, in different uh, traditions, Buddhist traditions. There's the Tibetan uh, Mahamudra meditation that kind of instills, it, it's like this, you go through different phases, and, and the ultimate phase is this phase of non-meditation. Um, so how does that work? Like, you know, how does this apply to... Uh, a daily practitioner of meditation or in the secular Buddhist lens, you know, if you're new to all this and you want to start meditating, how does it help to know any of this now, especially early on in the game? And I think the key is by grasping this intellectually at some point in your meditation, the only way you're going to be able to continue to progress with uh, gaining 
uh, wisdom into the nature of reality is to let go of whatever concept you have of what that nature of reality is. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So um, Alan Watts talks about this in terms of the attitude of faith. He says, the attitude of faith is to let go and become open to truth, whatever it might turn out to be. And I think this is very relevant with this concept of meditation because what you're doing is letting go of whatever you think meditation is or what it's supposed to do or how it's going to benefit you. You let go of that because there is nothing that's not supposed to do anything or benefit you in any way. And yet when you grasp that, that's when it benefits you because you've let go. And again, it's like this paradox. And I love this. Buddhism in general is like this paradox. There's, there's a teaching that says, you know, when you first start to study or learn Buddhism, you know, before mountains are mountains, rivers are just rivers, streams are just streams. And then you start to learn a little bit about Buddhism and, and it's exciting. And the more you start to learn, suddenly it's like, there's this, this awe to everything that you see and mountains aren't just mountains. Rivers aren't just rivers anymore. And streams aren't just streams. And the more time that you spend with it, and the more that you start to learn um, these the, the philosophical understandings and the teachings of Buddhism, then when you're done and you really get it, then you realize, oh, mountains are just mountains, rivers are just rivers, and streams are just streams. And yet that's what makes them so beautiful. I like to think about this with the teaching of, of the rose. You know, a rose is beautiful because a rose is just a rose. It doesn't bloom and then wait for someone to come along and pick it up and say, wow, you are a beautiful rose because it, it doesn't care. It, that's not the reason why the, a rose exists. It does not exist so that someone can pick it up and tell it it's beautiful. And yet that's what makes it beautiful because it just is what it is. And it's no different with us and our existence and the way that we try to learn to see things the way that they are. When you learn to see something the way that it is, then it becomes beautiful and almost magical simply f because it is just what it is. You've detached all of the meaning that you had behind it because remember, it's inside of these concepts and meanings and ideas that we attach to things that things get muddy. And muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone, as Alan, Wat Alan Watts says. So we leave things alone, meaning we let go of the meaning that we've attached to things, and then things just are what they are. And when we can allow things to just be what they are, then we start to see them as they really are. And meditation is that tool. So meditation itself can become a hindrance if we have meaning or ideas or concepts attached to what meditation is, what this is supposed to be doing for me. And I think the, the biggest mistake around this is spending time thinking meditation is working or meditation is not working or it's doing this, it's doing that. You know, all of this resides inside of the sphere of the meaning that we have around what meditation is or what it's supposed to do. And the whole point is that there is nothing that it's supposed to do. There's nothing it's supposed to mean. It's the exercise of just being with what is, learning to be comfortable with discomfort. It's sitting and observing the thoughts in the same way that you would sit outside and observe the clouds. You'd notice that the nature of watching clouds in the sky is that they arise or they appear, they linger, and then they go away. That's the nature of observing clouds. And that's also the nature of meditation and observing our thoughts. The nature of things as they are is that things arise, they linger for a while, and then they're gone. And that's isn't that the very nature of life itself? Things arise, they exist for a short time, and then they're, they're gone. And when we can allow ourselves to start to see things the way that they are, without attaching meaning to things, then we become that much closer to being enlightened. And see, this is another concept that the idea of enlightenment carries so much connotation around the meaning that we have about, about enlightenment. And if I were to ask you, what does it mean to be enlightened? You know, there's, everyone has an interpretation of what that means. 
And enlightenment in its purest form is nothing more than what I explained earlier about mountains are mountains, rivers are rivers, streams are streams. And then when we think we start to know what it means to be enlightened, that's when we're thinking, ooh, mountains aren't just mountains, rivers aren't just rivers, streams aren't just streams. It's something more. But then true enlightenment happens and you realize, oh, they are just mountains are just mountains. Rivers are just rivers. Streams are just streams. Life is just life. Happiness is happiness. Sadness is sadness. See, it's in allowing these things to be what they are, this attitude of faith to let go, to become open to reality, whatever it may be, that is the nature of awakening. That is the nature of enlightenment in the secular Buddhist understanding. And I, th- and this is what makes it all so beautiful. It's inside of that uh, space of allowing things to just be what they are that everything becomes beautiful. It's the concept of the rose. What makes the rose so beautiful is that it's just a rose. There's nothing more to it. That, you know, there's there's nothing that you add to it. A rose is a rose, and that's what makes it beautiful. A human being is a human being, and that's what makes us beautiful. All if if we could see all things like that with that lens of just allowing things to be what they are, it would change everything. And meditation is the tool to do that. That's the concept of meditation through non meditation. So I hope that resonates with you. And I think that's what touches at the heart of this concept of dust if you must is that we go through life and we're busy and we're doing things that we think we need to be doing and these things are meaningful. And yet at the end, we're just dust. We go back to being the one thing that we're trying to uh, clean up or trying to avoid all along. That's the one thing that we are. And it, I think it's a powerful message. And it's at the heart of why I want to share the things that I share as I study and learn and teach the concepts of, of Buddhism. Um, I want to I want to spread the message, and the idea of enlightenment being learning to see life just the way that it is. It's learning that there is what is, and then there is the story we create about what is. And and we tend to live and go through our entire life inside of the story of what is and never actually see what is. Imagine if you were to taste a food one day that you had never tasted before because your whole life You've only seen the menu and you've been in love with the menu and the pictures on the menu and the words that describe the dish and the price attached to it. Everything around the, the, the concept of what is, but you never actually experienced what is, which would be to taste the food. And it may seem silly, but that's what we do in life. There's what is, that's you know, the experiential version of of living is you're tasting the food and then there's the intellectual or conceptual understanding of what is that's like being in love with the menu thinking that this whole time what you've loved on the menu is actually the meal and it's not they're they're two completely different things and i think we do this a lot with meditation there's my idea of what meditation is what it's supposed to do and i and i know everything from a conceptual understanding of what meditation is That's the menu. And then one day you experience what meditation actually is. It's learning to see things as they are. That's like tasting the food. And it's a whole different thing. And that cannot be conveyed. You cannot convey that in words to someone else. You can only experience it. Using that menu as an example, I could, you know, I could taste all the food um, and, and enjoy the flavors, everything, and try to convey it to you. And maybe all you've ever experienced is what I'm exper- what I'm telling you on a menu, and you think, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, yeah, I see what this is, I see the ingredients, I, I get it. But you, but we can't. You until you taste it yourself, you're not going to know what that really is. That's the difference between meditation and learning that the key to meditation is actually non-meditation. Let go of the concept uh, that you have about meditation. And learn to just meditate, which is learn to just be with what is. Learn to uh, clear that muddy water uh, by leaving it alone, by not trying, by just being. So next time you practice your meditation, don't have any expectations about what it is, what it's supposed to do. Just practice sitting there and being with what is, whatever, whatever it turns out to be. 
And think about this attitude of faith that Helen Watts talks about, the, the attitude of faith of letting go and becoming completely open to truth, whatever it might turn out to be, learning to be with what is, whatever that might turn out to be. And let me know how that goes for you. I'd love to hear hear about it. We have the Secular Buddhism Facebook page, which, as I mentioned before, is exploding. There's the Secular Buddhism Study Group, which is also a Facebook group. There's the secularbuddhism.com website uh, where you can comment and post um, where I post the podcast. You can comment on that page or feel free to reach out to me. A lot of people have been reaching out to me directly and I respond to every email um, and I interact. You know, if at some point that becomes something that I cannot manage, then, you know, I'll stop saying to do that. But for now, Feel free to reach out to me directly at noah, N-O-A-H, at secularbuddhism.com. I'd love to discuss this concept with you and see what you think of it. Hopefully this is useful and helpful information to um, help you have a more positive life. So I send you guys my regards, and thank you once again for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of this journey with me, and I, I look forward to seeing where this goes from here. Thank you, and until next time.